I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. Al McFarlane. I'm Al McFarlane. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarlane. Uh, the state of education is important. Uh, the state of uh, the threat of violence in public schools is important. Uh, our communities are concerned about safety in public education in schools and concerned about gun legislation. It's a big debate. I want to have a focus on that in today's program. I'm pleased to have uh, one of the education leaders of the city of Minneapolis. Uh, Kim Ellison is an at-large member of the Minneapolis School Board. She serves as an officer of the board. She's the clerk of the board. And uh, I'm pleased to have Senator Jeff Hayden. Jeff, how you doing? Doing well, man. <laughs> Jeff represents District 62, which includes portions of South Minneapolis uh, and Hennepin County in the Twin Cities metro area. He is also the assistant uh, leader of the Democratic Caucus That's right. of the minor minority in the Senate. So I want to do two things. First of all, Jeff, you've got an article uh, in a recent issue of Insight News yeah. talking about your family's experience with violence. And it has to do kind of with education, kind of with youth culture, kind of with uh, this uh, availability mm -hmm. of guns. Uh, with respect, I wanted you to talk about that and, and your family's grief and how you uh, interpret that in your work. Yeah, well, thank you, and thank you, Al, for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, just about a week ago or a week and a half ago it was the 27th birthday of my sister Taylor, who unfortunately is no longer with us. She died uh, just about two years ago uh, on a vacation with her uh, girlfriends to Atlanta. She had resided in Houston. She went to Prairie View uh, College, um, uh, which is a historically black college, and uh, relocated to Houston. They went to Atlanta to a girls' weekend birthday, and unfortunately, gun violence broke out in the parking lot of the restaurant that they were coming out of, and in the exchange between the two people who were shooting at each other, she was an unfortunate victim and was killed. Um, and so we um, have wrestled uh, with this issue. Many of you guys know my father, uh, Dr. Peter Hayden, and his wife, uh, Joyce Hayden, uh, who have been pillars of this community, and, and my sisters, uh, as well, I have two younger sisters as well, and a, and a, well, I have about three younger sisters, but two uh, uh, that were directly related to Taylor. So we have been really struggling with this issue um, of gun violence like everybody else. I would also say that yesterday was the birthday of my best friend who was killed 22 years ago uh, in Minneapolis uh, due to gun violence as well. Mm -hmm. So we, I feel this each and every day like everybody else. And though we uh, have a unique focus these days on school shootings, and we should, uh, and the things that happen in those, uh, but in our communities, we have parklands every week mm -hmm. or every month. Um, you know, in our communities, unfortunately, young people, young people of color, young black people um, are being killed each and every day. My friend's son uh, is doing fantastic. He's got his MBA and a great career ahead of him. Unfortunately, he can't see him. He can't see his grandson because he's no longer here. Mm -hmm and he was killed by an African-American man. Um, uh, we are pretty sure that Taylor was killed, though they haven't apprehended, by an African-American man. So we are killing each other as well. And so the Taylor Hayden bill really is a conversation and an opportunity to 
give grants out to community-based organizations that have expertise in talking to our community and getting them to understand what is happening with gun violence. And what, when is, you, what does that mean? Who do, you, who do you expect to engage and support or invite? Right, uh, so we, we want to invite, we want, if, if this were to become law and the money was appropriated, we want it to become, um, a, we, we want to look at this as a public health crisis. So there's many ways, there's a lot of bills that I also support about assault bans and, and the bump stock and the loophole, and those things are really, really important. But we want to get behind and get into our community and start talking to these young people who are making the unfortunate decision to, to kill each other. And with that, uh, everybody else that's affected. So we're hoping to have a conversation uh, do an RFP and bring organizations together, have them develop plans to go out into our community and have this uh, conversation in hopes that we can curve the violence that's there, that we can give them the tools to resolve their differences without shooting, that we can move them in a direction that they, that they know that they're killing their uncles, sisters, future wives, grandfathers, because that's what's happening uh, in our community. So we think that that is extremely important. Does the Second Amendment argument come up in our community? How does that play uh, on the national media? The people such as NRA are adamant about not removing access to weapons of any kind, it seems to me, because they want to have a society that's uh, armed as instructed by the U.S. Constitution, Second Amendment in particular. Yeah, I do think we, that's do you a, hear that in our Yeah, I not? think that's a very false argument. Mm -hmm. We have restrictions all the time. We have... First Amendment, we're practicing it today. However, I can't yell fire in this room unless there is a fire, mm -hmm. right? I can't create hysteria and panic, but even though it's my right in which to say it, we restrict uh, 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 driver's license when you can vote, right? We, we say, now how is it that you can go buy a gun from an unlicensed gun dealer, right? But you can't go buy a car unless you have a driver's license and insurance. So if you think about this, if you want to go buy a bottle of wine, you have to show your ID and show that you're of age to be able to buy that. Mm -hmm. So we do this all the time. So it's a very false narrative to say, and the Supreme Court has also said this, that you can restrict. Mm -hmm. We had an assault weapons ban for like 20 years until it was until it was not renewed. So we have done this before, this hysteria about somehow I'm going to take your guns. And remember, I'm talking about responsible gun ownership. Mm -hmm. This is responsible gun ownership. So we want people to be responsible, but we also want to teach our community what guns do and what they do to people. My friend's father told me yesterday, who is an avid hunter, who has guns, right? His son was killed. He said an AR-15 has no other purpose but to kill right. human beings. He says he's never shot an AR-15 and he hunts every single year. He's got shotguns and rifles. He said, there's only one reason for that gun, Jeff. You gotta get him off the streets. This is a grieving father. My, my friends uh, died 22 years ago and his father has still not got, got over it. I can hear it in his voice. I have not got over it. When I call my father each and every day, I hear it in his voice, in my stepmother's voice. We are killing each other. We need to have a conversation and we also need to remove these, these, these guns are, 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 as I might say, weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. The amount of people that can be killed, we've seen it in Parkland, we've seen it in Las Vegas, we see it every day. These are the guns that are used in war theaters. This is what's being used in Iraq, in, in Baghdad, in, 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 in Afghanistan. It, these guns should not be on the streets of America. Kim, what about the schools? Uh, recently, uh, several, uh, a little while ago, there was a scare Yes. up at uh, Henry High School, I believe, yes, in yes. North Minneapolis. Yes. And while we always hope scares remain just that, uh, it, it's also troubling that things happen, but maybe somewhat comforting that there seemed to have been a plan in place. Well, there, so there, how does this district handle the, the possibility? There is a response, and it is a conversation that um, the district is having with our principals and with teachers. Um, I've not heard us going to active shooter drills as of yet, um, like I know they were doing in Parkland, but mm -hmm. um, but there was that scare. It was after hours, um, students had already been dismissed, someone ran off a bus and ran into the school building with a gun. And they were able, they shut down the school right away, 
Um, students were safe. The person ran in and ran out again, yes. so to understand, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but we didn't know. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't know why are they coming in here, mm -hmm. um, and why do they have a gun? Mm -hmm. So um, we were able to respond, and, and I guess then they then they left, and police came and went through the building to make sure it was clear, and all our students got out and got home safely. What do you imagine your counterparts in places like Park, Parkland mm -hmm. and Columbine are, are going through? and go through when these incidents keep happening and what do you feel as a mom as a parent yes. uh, but also as a elected official uh, about the emerging voices of young people i was just yes i was going to talk about that i was going to say i am i'm pleased to see our young folks step up and they are saying no this is not acceptable you cannot kill us um they did it in the 60s with the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. They came out and they said, no, we're not going to war. That is a useless war. And we, then the U.S. pulled back and mm -hmm. we threw out, came out. Now they're coming forward and they're saying, no, you cannot shoot us. Um, you, we, you need to stop this. And they're coming mm -hmm. to the state legislators. They're walking mm -hmm. out of schools mm -hmm. um, in protest, saying, we need to draw attention to this. Is that happening in our community in general? So this is students in general. Yes. But we talked a bit earlier, uh, Senator, about black people mm -hmm. killing black people. Mm -hmm. Is the same kind of thing happening in the quote unquote black community? Well, I think that it is. I think that um, young people are starting to realize what's happening um, and they are mobilizing. I know when they had the day of mobilization, my 16 year old daughter, she left school and marched in the streets and went to City Hall uh, and talked to their representatives there. So I think that there is a movement afoot and I think it's really important. And I think for legislators and elected officials alike, we should pay attention. My daughter will be voting in a year and a half and so or, or a whole bunch. And I think that they're going to exercise their rights at the polls to make sure that they have elected officials uh, that are going to follow kind of their lead. And that is, I think, really important and I think that is really the only way that we're going to find some of this change is that yesterday in the legislature um, they had a, some really uh, sensible bills. One that just said we want to have universal background checks, we want to make sure that someone that buys a gun doesn't have things in their background that, that should prohibit them mental health issues and or criminal uh, issues that should preclude them. And also a bill that says that if they, if a family member feels that this person has some problems, mm -hmm. that they can get their weapon away from them. And then while they go through the process to figure out okay, if it's domestic violence or suicide or suicidal mm -hmm. uh, ideations or tendencies, and then allow them to kind of cool off, get the treatment that they need. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very sensible bills. Um, and the GOP tabled the bills. Mm -hmm. They effectively killed the bills. They didn't even allow those bills. The only reason why they heard it is they had to procedurally hear it, but they just were so afraid of the backlash from the NRA that they tabled the bills. So what needs to happen is that people need to stand up, speak up in our community, in our allies, and be able to get the kind of representation that they need in order to pass these really smart uh, common sense bills. We don't know how long it'll last, but I watched the comic shows last night on TV and they were saying that President Trump uh, met with uh, a number of leaders uh, uh, in both parties. He saw it on television mm -hmm. uh, suggesting that uh, change needs to happen in terms of uh, automatic weapons mm -hmm. uh, being available. And that was a surprise mm -hmm. to some. Mm -hmm. But you're saying GOP here in Minnesota is not taking that position. They're taking the opposite position. They're saying, let's not touch or bring this discussion yeah, forward. Yeah, I think nationwide, and I actually think that President Trump, he's done this on several issues. Flip and flop. He says one thing yeah. and does another. The art of the deal to keep people off, either that or he really doesn't know from one day to the next what's going on. But it's really clear that the nations, the, the Republican Party of the nation does not have this. As a matter of fact, Delta Airlines in Atlanta uh, said that they uh, support an assault weapons ban and the GOP-led Senate in Georgia, their legislature, pulled a tax incentive that they had, that they had proposed for Delta. Now, mm -hmm. if you like tax incentives or not, that's not the point, but mm -hmm. they were going to give them a tax incentive to keep them mm -hmm. uh, in there, and they pulled that as punishment for Delta just simply saying that they support common sense gun legislation. Mm -hmm. So this is a real issue, um, and there's, real, there's a real signal out there um, led by the NRA 
led by gun manufacturers and bullet manufacturers. It's a very irresponsible position. However, it's gonna take courageous leaders mm -hmm. and it's gonna take public, including our youth and others, to put in courageous leaders to look at those folks in the eye and say, listen, we are not going to have this anymore and pass really smart legislation. What should the district be doing? What should uh, educators be doing in Minnesota to look at, uh, to formulate policy to support um, safety for children, for students, teachers? Uh, is there a discussion here about arming teachers? Okay, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, my sister's a teacher um, in, in Michigan, and, um, and, and we have said, yeah, we can't see you with the gun. Um, so yeah, that and, and teachers don't want to be armed. As a matter of fact, I've I've had teacher friends say, if that becomes law, I will have to leave the field of education. <coughs> I'm not taking a gun mm -hmm. to my building. Um, we had a scare at the beginning of the school year outside of a building. It was um, with a, a school, an elementary school on Penn Avenue in North Minneapolis, and. There were some cars da driving down the street shooting at each other. Um, and I remember reading a post from a principal who that night was, you know, trying to get through all of this, and she said, shots fired is not a term that they teach you how to deal with when you go to, to principal school, to principal training, um, and then discuss everything. You know, she, there was a class that was outside, and how do we get them inside, and how do we make sure that they're safe? Um, but having a gun was never an issue, like we should have had a, a gun to be safe. No, it's, we need to get our students inside, we need to make sure the doors are locked. Um, and, but there is th that conversation. Okay. I'm Al McFarland, this is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll take a break, when we come back, we'll talk to Senator Jeff Hayden, uh, who is um, representing District 62 mm -hmm. in Minnesota's Senate, and to Kim Ellison, uh, elected citywide to the Minneapolis Board of Education about a couple of areas. One, uh, the priorities for the upcoming, the ongoing legislative session that we're in right now, Senator Hayden, and uh, uh, Kim Ellison uh, about uh, plans to uh, uh, address still uh, embarrassing disparities in outcomes uh, for communities of color, mm -hmm. uh, according to recent state reports. Stay tuned, we'll be back. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. Well, I'm waiting for the train to come in. Well, I'm waiting to see my mama again. Well, I'm waiting till the morning light. Well, I'm waiting to see things get right. Take away the gun. Don't want to hurt no one. Take away the gun. Don't want to hurt no one. Here come the frame. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm pleased to have as guest today Senator Jeff Hayden, a member of the Minnesota Senate. He represents District 62, includes uh, portions of South Minneapolis and Hennepin County in the Twin Cities metro area here. And Kim Ellison, she serves as the clerk um, of the Minneapolis Board of Educa Education. She's elected to the board as a member at large. Uh, I thank you both for being here. You know, before the break, I told you we wanted to go into uh, Senator Hayden getting a sense of mm -hmm. issues on the table right now sure. uh, at the legislature. So give us an update, a report. Well, good, good. Well, we uh, started a session about two weeks ago, and uh, we are kind of going through our paces. Uh, this is what's technically a policy and bonding year. Those, those have been kind of conflated uh, over the past few years. Um, we have set our state budget in just uh, two days ago, uh, they came out and showed that we had about a 385 million or so surplus 
uh, meaning that, A, we don't have to cut anything and that there'll be a small supplemental budget bill. So we're kind of focused now on what that might look like. Um, what's really going to kind of lead um, is this issue of tax conformity, which is a pretty complicated way of saying um, the federal government made some major changes in our tax code, and Minnesota usually aligns itself with it um, in order to make your taxes kind of work. Um, but in doing that, <clears throat> some of the things that the federal government has done is capped certain deductions for property tax and charitable giving and others, which um, creates a situation in which um, some Minnesotans would, might, would have to pay more taxes. So on one hand, the state would benefit by getting more money. On the other hand, middle class tax uh, uh, payers may have to pay more. Uh, which is something that none of us are really interested in. So we have to do some really complex work on trying to create a tax conformity for ease and simplification of your taxes, mm -hmm. but at the same time not penalize people in the way in which the Trump budget has. Secondly, we need, we need to look at what the implications are down the line. Some people may see a little bit more money in their paychecks these days, and they may even see a little bit more money on their tax returns. However, that was $1.5 trillion at the federal government that that cost us, and they're going to have to find a way to pay it. So either they got to borrow it, and remember, these are the same groups that went after President Obama for borrowing and that the world was going to end because we were, gonna, we were borrowing too much money. Well, they're going to have to borrow money in order to balance the budget, and they're going to have to cut. And one of the things that Speaker Ryan... But, but that's kind of their intent, is to cut and restrict uh, you know, things that they view as entitlements or support for people, right. but not to reduce military spending or things that support corporate uh, and business growth, right? Yeah, yeah. The biggest, the, the permanent cuts that were made were in the corporate rate. It went from about 36% down to 20. Those are permanent. There was a, 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 a rate cut for reg regular people, but it was only like four or five years. It mm -hmm. wasn't permanent. Right. So the biggest folks that got the cuts were uh, very wealthy people and very wealthy corporations. Mm -hmm. But in order to make that up, once again, you got to borrow mm -hmm. or you got to cut. Now, let me tell you, the big ticket items in which you can cut in order for you to actually mm -hmm. make it work, they can trim around the edges, are Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. So it is our elderly people who depend or disabled that depend on Social Security, they paid into it, or it is people who have complex health care needs or need health care, and then our seniors who depend on Medicare. Those are where the big chunks. So when they talk about entitlements, let's be clear that where those cuts will be made will hurt. Uh, just like in Minnesota, the biggest chunk of our health and human service budget is elderly and disabled, mm -hmm. right? So that's a value. And that's our values to say that we got a couple more dollars in our paycheck. Big corporations got a lot of, got a, got a big cut. They can make more money, give their shareholders more money on the backs of our elderly and disabled and low income people. So and we got to figure that out. And with things like line item vetoes of budgets, mm -hmm. uh, targeted cuts typically end up targeting the people with the least amount of voice, yes. the least resistance. That ends up translating into our people. Absolutely. And so how do you see that happening? Well, that's, that's where we really got to stand up and we got to fight. L l luckily, in the Minnesota Senate, we have a 34-33 split. So we're in the minority by one vote. And we believe uh, that Lieutenant Governor Fishbox should not be serving in the Minnesota Senate. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is some p pending litigation to solve that issue. So if that happens and they read and the Supreme Court potentially reads the Constitution as we read it, Article 5, Section 5, that says that the lieutenant governor ascends, that the president of the Senate, last presiding officer, ascends to the lieutenant governor when it becomes vacant. And there's also a provision in there that says that you can't hold two offices with the exception of uh, postmaster general and uh, and uh, a notary republic, which she's either, we believe that she will uh, have to ascend there, and then it becomes a 33-33 tie, and we can stop some of these tough cuts that we think are coming down the line. So we're going to really focus on those issues. We need to continue to work on health care. The gun legislation that we talked about in the segment before, we're hoping to continue to uh, push uh, the GOP and get people rallied uh, behind those issues. Those are some of the major uh, priorities that uh, we're going to have. We're still looking at workforce development mm -hmm. and those issues and continuing to think about what that looks like for us and how do we get uh, more people into the workforce and align them with the jobs that the, that the business community says that they need. 
uh, that's certainly uh, a priority for us. Uh, you know, those are just some of the things that we're looking to do uh, in a supplemental budget. And then the bonding bill, which really puts Minnesotans to work. Um, there is, the governor has proposed about a billion and a half worth of bonding. The GOP says they only want to do 600, but that really goes to fixing our roads, our bridges, right? It creates transit opportunities. It goes into uh, repairing our, our universities, our schools. Uh, so we're looking for an opportunity to make sure that our infrastructure is together and not only does that have, make us competitive uh, throughout the country to, to drawing business here, but it puts people to work. So one of the issues that uh, you've been in the forefront of is trying to encourage our government to recognize that there are many more mm -hmm. people that should be providing mm -hmm. goods and services mm -hmm. to our state. Mm -hmm. And you've seen the report that's come out uh, from ALF, uh, African mm -hmm. American Leadership Forum. Mm -hmm. uh, they've reported recently that uh, despite appreciable gains, uh, significant gains mm -hmm. in purchases from mm -hmm. African American businesses, the uh, most recent data show that uh, half of 1% uh, mm -hmm. of purchases from a seven unit uh, mm -hmm. complex they put together that includes the state, uh, Hennepin County, mm -hmm. city of Minneapolis, city of St. Paul, mm -hmm. and a couple of other units. Mm -hmm. uh, out of uh, $4.2 billion mm -hmm. in purchases, uh, 23 million or less than one half of 1% mm -hmm. went to African American businesses. Mm -hmm. How do you continue to focus uh, the attention of the state, of our community, and uh, the legislators uh, and administrators so that there is change that opens up access and opportunity that reflects parity? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I think I'm glad that the African American Leadership Forum uh, is focused on that. It's something that we've been focused on for a while. Um, I know that uh, the, the schools are thinking about that. This is all units of government, but it's an intentional strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's something that has been intentional to exclude us, so it has to be intentional to include us. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we have to do. We have to be courageous in our seats to really draw that out. The other thing is community has to start to focus on this a bit, mm -hmm. right? I think that sometimes what happens in our community is we kind of think about what's directly in front of us. And what this is talking about is more planning. You have to have opportunities. One of the things we have to have is we're really big consumers, but we don't own businesses at the same level as well. So there is a little bit of complexity behind those numbers, which is to say we need to do more but we also have to have more McFarland Media Enterprises. Mm -hmm. We have to have more of these businesses. So we have to help build those. Part of the work that we did with the Equity Fund was to give money to MEDA, Neighborhood Development Center, and others to build. The Neighborhood Development Center kind of takes you from the basics mm -hmm. and gets you started in an incubator or moving forward. MEDA kind of takes you once you're successful and gets you to the next level. Mm -hmm. So we also have to continue to focus on that side of it so that we can have those businesses to do business with. So it's a very multi-level and complex issue, mm -hmm. but that's shameful and we should do more. And if we, and those numbers, as they rise, so does our community. There's a direct correlation to, as we give more money to communities of color, as we do more business, let me clarify that, mm -hmm. with communities of color and our kind of gross national product, if you will, you know, our, our, our base goes up, mm -hmm. crime goes down. Mm -hmm. Educational outcomes are better. Mm -hmm. Right? There is direct correlation to poverty and the issues that we have. This is wealth building and this is wealth creation. So I'm trying to talk about it not only from a social justice point of view and a business point of view, but it also saves government from spending money on things like corrections and out-of-home placement and spending a lot of money uh, in the school system to supplement kind of the things that parents could do if they had meaningful employment and were growing their wealth. The challenge is that there are sectors in the economy that depend on uh, dysfunction mm -hmm. in other sectors of the community. Mm -hmm. So our community ends up being a product, mm -hmm. fodder, mm -hmm. for a grist mill. Uh, they call it the prison industrial complex, mm -hmm. right? And so there mm -hmm. are communities and economies mm -hmm. uh, that uh, benefit from continued dysfunction in our community. How do we, and what you're suggesting is equity means eliminating mm -hmm. Uh, those barriers to uh, employment, mm -hmm. to business, to opportunity in ways that reduce the propensity to be involved in things that have a negative consequence in terms of people's experience with corrections. Well, you know, there is a bit of a movement afoot. I have had more GOP members, members to the right, that wants to talk about this issue, about this 
prison industrial complex are corrections costs. Mm -hmm. I think what they started to figure out is they've created this movement, they've kind of sent us all to jail, it costs. Mm -hmm. It costs them a lot of money and it's not really, really want to spend their money anymore. Mm -hmm. I just did this kind of bit during the Super Bowl with a very conservative Republican that said that we both agree, we agree on corrections reform. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a realization that that is money that is wasted, that they're not getting the bang for their buck mm -hmm. out of that. And so there is some bipartisan support, I'm not holding my breath, at looking at criminal justice reform. But what I'm telling them is, Criminal justice reform and sentencing reform is really important, but the opportunities have to be there so that people don't go back to the economy in which is available to them. A lot of our folks are in prison, not only because of this, this disparate sentencing cycles and all of that, but because they took advantage of the marketplace that was in front of them, mm -hmm. and that was this kind of illegal side. So we have to create a marketplace and an economy where those smart people can think about, you know, how to take a kilo all the way down to a gram in a computer lab, in a chemistry lab, mm -hmm. as opposed to on the street selling uh, illicit drugs. Mm -hmm. Kim, what about the district? Uh, the district is a big business, I think almost a billion dollars, or is it, what's the number? It's a billion dollar enterprise. It was. And uh, what's happening there to uh, promote this notion of inclusion and diversity? And I remember uh, Gary Suddeth used to say, follow the money, you know, and so I think we're saying that again to ourselves and to uh, legislators and, and directors, let's follow the money. Mm -hmm. Can you show me how the movement of money reflects equity and, and, and justice uh, and reflects our interest as patrons or owners of the enterprise of education? What do you think? Right, well, um, and it is important to us on the district, um, in the district, we, um, every year, every month, I'm sorry, when we approve our contracts, um, we ask staff to provide um, what's our diversity spend. Mm -hmm. How much are we spending um, in diversity businesses, um, in diverse businesses, and which is important, you know, so they're paying attention. Mm -hmm. It does not match the students that we serve, but, you know, it's a step in mm -hmm. the right direction. The second question, uh, and it's related, I believe, is uh, the state's uh, recent reports uh, yes. about still large gaps yes. between students of color and uh, the overall student population. Give us a, a, a sort of a synopsis of what the most recent reports indicate. Okay, the most recent reports show that there was an increase in achievement in all, um, if we disaggregate the data, mm -hmm. um, in our all uh, each race group. Mm -hmm. Um, and that students of color uh, grew at a higher rate than the white students, there's still this huge gap. Mm -hmm. um, it is, is not equal at all. So we look at the district, well, what are some of the things we can do to, to address that? One thing that has come up a lot is we need more diverse teachers. We need more teachers in front of students who look like the students that they're serving. Um, and we ask the the district for a report on that. And in Minneapolis, I think it's somewhere around 16% of our teachers are teachers of color. Mm -hmm. That's serving a student population that is 67% mm -hmm. students of color. Um, but then they compare it statewide, it's 4% mm -hmm. teachers of color. And so while we're doing like a whole lot better than the state, what that points to is the need to diversified the teaching. Um, and what are the barriers right. to that? Why, why isn't it happening quickly or more quickly? Yes, and that's one thing we've asked. Is, okay. And um, we, in Minneapolis, we have a residency program mm -hmm. because our um, aides, our educational aides, are much more diverse mm -hmm. than our teaching, mm -hmm. um, than our teachers. And so we're just like, well, what if we have these aides, educational aides who are already in our schools, already working with our students, how can we get them a teaching license so that they can teach our students? So that's, that's been one thing. Mm -hmm. There is not um, a big draw, you know, big group of teachers of color to draw from. So that's one way that the district has tried to address it. Okay. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. When I come back, we'll continue with Senator Jeff Hayden and with Kim Ellison. Senator Hayden represents South Minneapolis. He's the assistant minority leader in the Minnesota Senate. And Kim Ellison elected to 
uh, the school board at large, so citywide uh, election, uh, and uh, is clerk of the Minneapolis School Board. We'll talk more about priorities, their vision for building community and the roles their institutions play in doing that. Stay tuned. I'm just a dreadlock Just a cowboy coming to your town I'm just a dreadlock Coming to your town She's the kind of girl that makes me feel so nice. I want to love her more than once or twice. It's okay, it's so alright. I want to be your special cowboy tonight. I'm your cowboy, please. I'm Jeff Dreadlock. Cowboy coming to your town, yeah. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. I want to continue with Senator Jeff Hayden, uh, representing South Minneapolis, District 62, and Kim Ellison on the Minneapolis School Board. I wanted to get a sense in this last segment, uh, your vision mm -hmm. for priorities for the community. As you talk to uh, people that voted for you or not for you, but they are people you represent, what are you hearing? Mm -hmm. And what's your feeling of what we need to do together to uh, motivate, encourage more citizen involvement, citizen ownership of the enterprise of serving our community? Kim, what do you think? I think it's, it's huge, so, so vote, yes. Um, run, um, and if that's not something that you want to do it, to run, vote for people who reflect your values. Mm -hmm. Vote for people who um, will say the things that you once said in the levels of government. I had a conversation, um, I was listening to a conversation with our newly elected North Minneapolis council members, mm -hmm. and so the voting, coming out and voting is very huge, and they said the combined number of people who voted for Ward 4 and Ward 5, which are North Minneapolis seats, so Council Member Cunningham and Council Member Ellison, if you added all the people who voted for them, it was still less than the number of people who voted for one Council Member um, of Warsami in South Minneapolis. People pay attention to that. They look at that and they say, well, okay, well, this community doesn't seem as engaged. And so maybe if we have to make decisions, Yes, we don't have to pay as much attention right. to this community that's not engaged. And so if you don't want to run, vote for people who support your values mm -hmm. and then vote. Mm -hmm. um, that's very important. And then stay engaged. Continue to talk to the people that you um, have put into office. They want to hear from you. We, you know, I'm not here to say, okay, Kim Ellison thinks that this ought to happen. No, I want to know what the community that put me in office feels mm -hmm. um, so that I can bring their voice to the table. Uh, off camera, we talked about some collaborations you're creating. Yes. You convened uh, all of the electeds, or yes. many of them, from, uh, North, from North Minneapolis, Minneapolis to address a particular issue, but it's leading to the possibility of a broader assessment yes. of uh, both challenges and opportunities. Talk it was, about it that was, if you It like. was very exciting. Um, like I said, I was talking to a principal who said, well, here's my problem, is there are so many levels of government, and you guys don't seem to be talking to each other. So I sent on an email, I said, let's sit down and talk. So um, the parks, the schools, the city, the state, and federal government, all the people who were elected who live in North Minneapolis and serve North Minneapolis residents, we came together. And we just talked about our priority. What's, what's our top three priorities? Mm -hmm. um, Which were they? What housing were they? came up mm -hmm. a lot. Um, job creation mm -hmm. came up, safety, and um, youth violence, and so, We've decided that every month we're going to sit down and continue the conversation. That hasn't happened before, to my knowledge. Fifteen years ago, I've heard. Okay. okay. Um, and, and I don't think it was every level of government. Okay. I think the parks, the schools, and the city mm -hmm. met. Um, and so, yeah, this is a first. Mm -hmm. And we had another meeting this morning. And we was like, okay, what are our priorities and mm -hmm. how can we? One thing that came up that 
had not even occurred to me was a driver's license school, a center in North Minneapolis students can go to learn how to drive because huh. they're driving. It's not that they're not driving, but do they have their license? And right. how can we make sure that um, they're driving, they're driving legally, they're safe, they're insured? Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, well, yes, this needs to happen. And like I said, so the city said, well, this is, these are some things that we can do. How can we talk to students? I'm like, well, we can get to the schools mm -hmm. um, and say, you know, what is it important to you that, and like I said, we have the parks there as well. I said, you know, these things are happening in the parks. And were, this is one way that we're trying to keep students safe in the parks. And so it's just an amazing conversation to be so, having. Senator Hayden, uh, first of all, address the question of how do we promote civic engagement? And you might speak to this question of creating special collaborations mm -hmm. to make things happen in our community. So I just think it's really important. For instance, we have a generational election. We're in a, a vote for two U.S. senators. Uh, we have a congressional election that we always have. We're going to, the House of Representatives in the state level um, are going to be up in the governor. Mm -hmm. So there is a real opportunity. And so if you want to see change uh, in your elected officials, or if you want, then you, you got to vote. You got to get involved. You got to, and you got to not make it a passive uh, kind of thing. Well, maybe I won't. Or You got to engage. You got to say, you got to really start to think about what is it that I want? What, what motivates somebody to go to a precinct caucus, for example, or to submit his or her name to be a delegate or to get involved in the party, pol party politics, either, you know, either party? Uh, but what is it? What is it that attracts a citizen to bring her or his voice to the table? Well, I mean, what I, what I hear most of the time, unfortunately, is a lot of people um, who either have a lot of issues or a lot of complaining. Mm. Right, but what I don't always hear is people kind of saying kind of what their solutions are. Right, so I encourage people to say kind of like, well, what would you do? Right, and people usually do have it, but you have to encourage them, and then you have to say, well, then what do I do? Well, then you got to show up. Right, right. If you're what, what's the saying? It says, you know, if you're not you um, at the table, at, at the table you're, you're on, on the, the menu. menu. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if you don't show up, I don't care if it's at your church or your mosque, or your synagogue, or wherever the case may be, if you're not picking up Insight News and educating yourself, then you're just complaining, mm -hmm. right? And so there is a responsibility that citizens have to their society which to participate. You may want to run for office like us. You may want to just, you, it might just be an engagement on an issue. Mm -hmm. It might be a cleanup. Mm -hmm. It might be volunteering uh, to a coach a sports team. It might be showing young people how to play ch uh, chess or to teach them how to drive or whatever the case may be. But what we have to do is we have to be active participants in our society. And caucuses or delegates or just being or marching in the streets, those are just various ways in which you can do so. But what we have to, well, what we can't be is passive kind of participants that sit around on the stoop and complain about what's happening. You have to be part of that solution. And for me, uh, so one going to the polls, it really does mean something. Mm -hmm. It actually changes. We just won a special election in the Minnesota Senate by 500 votes, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And there have been closer votes than yep. that, yep. right? Um, in North Minneapolis, um, when uh, Representative Dean won the first time, yeah. 18 votes, I think it was something like that, you know? Um, when Natalie Johnson Lee won years ago with 70 votes, right. it matters. <laughs> it, it makes your, your vote actually matters. So we have to really kind of get ourselves kind of out of this kind of collective malaise and really start to move forward and turn your kind of complaints into action. And if you do so, things change. Things change at the school board, things change at the city, things change at the state if you're actively involved. When I did the, our Senator Champion and I were leading this equity conversation mm -hmm. to try to get it on the table, everybody participated. We were the ones that got, that were, you know, that had to do the, a lot of the work inside of the Capitol and all of that kind of stuff. But it was also when the United Black Legislative Caucus, a kind of a group of citizens that had come together very loosely, no real structure, no mm -hmm. real hierarchy, but they came together enough to find their way to the Capitol and go to the powers that be and knock on the door and say, we demand yeah. 
that you share some of those resources that we paid into the state with our community. And as that a result, was very helpful. As a result, what happened? We got $35 million immediately and $35 million, what we call the mm -hmm. tails in future years, mm -hmm. to deal with this issue of teacher training. What mm -hmm. uh, Kim just talked about, their mm -hmm. Pathways program, we funded it through that, mm -hmm. right? Um, we funded uh, entrepreneurship. We funded job training all throughout the state, right? We funded youth uh, uh, programs. We funded organizations like Umjama and, and others that are working with black men that are, that are, that are coming out of the prison system. But that happened because not only because we did it, but because citizens came together. Like I said, there was no real hierarchy. There still right. isn't in that group. Mm -hmm. There's still no president. There's still nobody's getting paid. And they took time out on that day to come and knock on our doors and knock on the Speaker of the House doors and said, frankly, it is time for us for you to share some of those resources. That kind of civic engagement, that kind of direct action that we're working together with the purpose Combine that with your elected officials who understand public policy and how to do it, and then you bring the citizens together. It gave me a lot of leverage mm -hmm. to sit down in those meetings and okay. those negotiations and look around the state leaders and say, listen, the people have spoken. What are we going to do? And if we don't get this done today, they'll be back tomorrow. Let's look at the shifting uh, landscape. Uh, in an earlier program, we had uh, newly elected uh, Park Board Commissioner mm -hmm. Latricia Vital. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm here Very with impressive. with uh, Acting Superintendent Mary Merrill. That's your yeah, yeah, I know her. <laughs> you know her. Right? <laughs> but, uh, a great program. And what I loved about the program was that they represent what I think is a sea change. Mm -hmm. uh, Latricia uh, Londell, French, is it yeah. French, and um, I think uh, A.K. Hassan, mm -hmm. uh, three persons mm -hmm. of color on the mm -hmm. school board. That hasn't happened before, mm -hmm. I don't think. Mm -hmm. And then we have an ally, a North Sider, mm -hmm. uh, like Kale Severson, mm -hmm. uh, and others that are just mm -hmm. good people. So mm -hmm. I think you got a, another mm -hmm. um, group that mm -hmm. understands community differently, mm -hmm. that understands uh, the notion of equity mm -hmm. and engagement that is not afraid mm -hmm. to explore and nurture mm -hmm. uh, voices, resources, mm -hmm. strategies from within the community. I believe that in the past, uh, uh, the authorities mm -hmm. saw themselves as having to resist mm -hmm. leadership and equity from the black community and other communities of color. That there was, in effect, a um, uh, not a, um, a sort of intentionality, though it may have been there, but not a, um, a vicious uh, or nefarious intentionality to, to exclude uh, equity and participation. Things just work that way. Now, I'm being kind. I was going to say. I'm being <laughs> kind. I'm just not trying to be accusatory at mm -hmm. this moment because I could say it differently as mm -hmm. well. But I think things are changing because new voices are coming. So I wanted you to give me a sense of how you see the movement uh, towards engagement and shift, both of you, if you would, uh, you know, with the uh, city council, with Jeremiah, yes. and uh, the new representatives there, and also people like uh, um, uh, Latricia Vital. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see that changing? What's the future coming up at the midterm elections down the road? Who wants to go so, first? So yeah. I think the future yeah. is bright. Yeah. So I think that there is, um, unfortunately, we go through these waves and cycles, but mm -hmm. I think the future is bright because the Minneapolis Park Board, mm -hmm. Um, the Minneapolis School Board and the Minneapolis City Council in particular, those are the you know, places that I, are, are often, sometimes they're just really good advocates that just want right to do good things, but often there, there are kind of these training grounds that allow them to continue in politics and kind of go mm -hmm. maybe to state legislature and on, on to Congress. I think the future is bright. These are very smart folks who reflect the values of their community. And that is just what it's all about. The city is changing, it's growing, it's becoming more diverse. So our elected officials sh should become more diverse. Uh, Representative Omar, Johan Omar, we've talked um, you know, a lot about her and, and, uh, and, and Aaron May Quaid and, and, and others, Fu Lee. Um, these are representatives of Abdi Warsami, Senator Her. The, our legislature is becoming, we have a number of native uh, folks that are now kind of standing up and now in the legislature. That's reflective of our community. I think it is, I'm ecstatic about it. I love to have the allies there on all levels of government. And I think we're gonna get a much better product, much more authentic at a much better cost because they understand their communities and they know what the most effective thing is to do. 
And, and not only that, but I, I, I had a conversation with, with Jeremiah um, and Philippe, too, mm -hmm. in city council, and they don't just want to hold this position and speak for the people. They also want to educate the people. This is what the city is doing. Mm -hmm. This is how you can help. Mm -hmm. These are things that the city can do, um, and this is where your voices can be heard. And, and so they're educating um, the community about the process of what it looks like to be in City Hall or on a school board or at the state legislature, um, which is very exciting. So then people, um, when they come off the streets, they know what they're talking about and they know what they can ask for. We're down to our last couple of minutes. I wanted to ask you both sort of to give a prescription or a recommendation, a vision of uh, for community as you see it. Where do you see us uh, heading? You know, and let me put this in this context. I've asked my guests for the mm -hmm. past several weeks mm -hmm. to uh, to focus on the uh, the power of the image of the movie mm -hmm. Black Panther. Mm -hmm. It's a game changer. I don't know if you've seen it or not. I have. Uh, so when you look at that movie and you think about your district and your people, mm -hmm. our people, what do you think is the future? Well, I think one of the things that was really clear to me was, you know, there are various ways in which you can get to kind of the, the same point, right? Um, and that we need to be able to figure out, and, um, you know, we hadn't, I hadn't been able to talk much about our wonderful mayor here in St. Paul, Melvin Carter, and his electrifying speech, he said that we can have unity without uniformity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just, I keep saying that over and over. I don't know if it's an original quote from him or he got it from somebody, but I love it. We sometimes try to act, we, we get at this thinking that we all have to be alike mm -hmm. and we all have to be in lockstep. Well, we don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. We can get to the same goal. At the legislature, the best policy we have is when we have a robust debate and we walk it through the process and what you started out with is usually not the same thing you end with, but it, hopefully it's better and all voices have been there. We need to have that conversation in our community as well. Not everybody agrees with uh, the way that public education uh, works today. Mm -hmm. I have some fierce disagreements with an approach that really smart, good people in our community are having. And I'm okay with that because hopefully what we know we have to do better Right. So hopefully we can get there. So what I would say is we have to have that. And then what we really have to do is to figure out how not to sabotage ourselves, how other. not to hurt each other, mm -hmm. how not to uh, allow these things to go. And then the last thing I will say is even I and I have some folks there that I am really disappointed with and have been angry with. But to learn how to forgive mm -hmm. and to learn how to give people some grace and some mercy and give people an opportunity for some redemption and also allow myself to know that I need to do that as well. I think that that healing uh, needs, or that, that action needs to happen in our community. Kim Ellison, in a few words, what sure, do you think? I think what I'm most excited about is conversations that I've had is it's clear to me we all have the same goal. We might have different ways that we think we can get there, but we want our students learning. We want our communities better. We want our communities safer. Um, and so how do we get there? We need to keep having those conversations. What does that look like? Um, it's going to make some people uncomfortable, but I think that means we're on the right track. So. Listen, thank you both so very much. Uh, continued success in your work uh, and in your community in representing us. Uh, I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. When it's all over and done, you'll be the love under the sun. Turn around, don't look back. Always remember. Sometimes when we stand strong Like a panther All alone Remember where we all came from That will be a place where go Place where go A place where go And you know We will be stronger much longer if we all stay.
Stand together, we'll be better. I want to be a better man, too, for you. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> Wayne. Good job. I'm just a cowboy. I'm going to come into your town. Every time I see you, you make my heart go wild. Every time you kiss me, you make me want to smile. It's all right, it's okay. I want to be that special lover today. want to be your cowboy, please. 